Hi, I'm Jessica. And I'm Tracy. And this is She's on Top, the place where we celebrate and elevate women. And this is our series called The New Normal. And today we are honored to have actress Tracy Ann Oberman from Britain. Now, our audience will probably know her best as um, Ricky's Blind Date on the series The Afterlife, which just came out. And also, but she's got a new YouTube series called Dunbreeden, which is not a place in Scotland. I'm trying to say it with an English accent, but it's Dunbreeding, which means you finished having kids, which uh, she launched during um, after COVID. But we'll we'll learn more about that when we talk to her. So hi, Tracy. Hi, hi, hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. I'm very excited because I've known Tracy since basically before she's born. We we our mums were best friends. We grew up in London together. And we went to the same school, and our sisters are friends, and we've known each other until I emigrated and came to Toronto. Yeah, Tracy and was my first friend. You were little, you were little babies. We used to play together every day. Exactly. We went to the same schools together. We, we have so many stories. And it was funny because we kind of lost touch, and we, we caught up again, and so many great stories. But, I mean, Tracy, ever, ever since I've known you, you've wanted to be an actress. When we were little, we even had a show called The Two Tracys. Yes, we did. We pitched. <laughs> Picture two to we picture to Jimmy Savile, who turned out then to be the biggest nonce on the planet. And my mum <laughs> always said, "Oh, there's something weird about that man." And ripped up our letters between <laughs> you from Stanmore. So it's, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, that's BBC. <laughs> they does. Never to know exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so Tracy, um, you've always wanted to be an actress, and you've had a really, really successful career. Can you, for our audience here in Canada, can you tell us a little bit about about your career? Yeah, so I, um, I I think I like to think of myself kind of renaissance. So I act, I write, I'm, I'm also a broadcaster. Uh, so I, I, I well, let's think. So I went to drama school. After drama school, I was with the Royal Shakespeare Company for four, four or five years. From that, I went into doing lots of television comedy. Um, after television comedy, I went on to BBC Radio Four, and I did about six, seven hundred radio comedies, radio plays, radio dramas. After that, I went into EastEnders, uh, which is a long-running soap opera. I don't know if you get it over there and that's like the big that was particularly then in those days is it was the biggest tv show bbc kind of flagship show I ended up murdering Dirty Den you probably remember Dirty Den Tracy he's the soap's biggest character in Great Britain and buried him under the Queen Vic pub and we had a one hour special when I did that and that was about 18 million people watched that wow. episode which was really big in, in England and in a way that kind of changed my career from really good solid jobbing actor who was always doing lots of tv and lots of theater and lots of radio to being like a household you know when 17 18 million people have watched you in something it's a it's kind of a game changer and then after that i went straight into doctor who which is on the bbc another flagship show and then and on it's gone and so i've worked solidly kind of um all my life really so that's and also within that i always felt I was never in it for the fame. I was only ever in it for the work. So I, you know, particularly after EastEnders, when it when I couldn't walk out without twenty or thirty paparazzi following me around at any one time. This was before reality shows kind of took took the place of soap operas. Um, I always felt that if the, if the play or the work meant something to me, I'd be quite happy doing it above a pub, you know, as long as the, the, the project meant something. And on the back of that, I got confidence to write. So I write a lot of Radio 4 plays and comedies and and it's gone on from there. It's, it's amazing. You were just in a play, weren't you, that was based in, in Toronto? It was a, yeah. It was a, yeah. In, in York, York, York and Mills, is that right? Is that York right? Mills, oh, that's <laughs> right. That's where, I came, that's where I immigrated to. That's where I first lived when I came to oh. York Mills. That's crazy. York Mills, it was, um, oh yes, it was, wasn't it, Brenda Kapowitz? Brenda, oh, no, I knew all about the Canadian Oat and a Boot. Or Oat, oat and a Boot. And it, was, <laughs> it was all about, yeah, it was a Canadian accent. Um, yes, it was, it was based on a true story of a Jewish woman whose son and his friend ended up raping girls in different uh, university college campuses Jesus. and eventually mm. handed themselves in and this was set in set in York and Mills, uh, York Mills and this was the week of house arrest when the mother was left with her son wow. and that was based on a true story actually the, the, yeah. the, the I can't remember what it was called the Kappa something rapist and it was about as a mother how much responsibility do you have for your child? Are you meant wow. to love your child through anything? And it was particularly poignant because if you look at what's going on in Britain with lots of young girls and boys 
league with women, particularly going off to join the sort of jihadi cult of, um, of ISIS at the time, that feeling of, you know, as a mother, you're, you're, you're meant to, and it's nature that you're meant to love your child in spite of anything. But do we have to? What does being a mother mean when you find it repulsive wow. what your child's done? So it was a very interesting play, but it was very much set in Canada. So I love I, it. I, I was knee deep in Canadian colleges and Canadian lifestyle and Canadian winters, and then the ex husband lives in Winnipeg. And <laughs> so I'm yeah, desperate to come to Canada. Well, at any time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always fascinated, you know, about the serendipity of when you're working on something as an actress or a show and what's going on. And I really felt that with um, Afterlife because it, I watched it, I binge watched the second series. It had me like as a puddle on the floor. And it was funny when I got on Facebook, I was amazed at the amount of men that were friends of mine that were talking about it. They were like, you have to yeah. watch this. And my family's a wreck. And I thought it is so poignant because I thought it's a, a story of a man grieving the life that won't come back which is kind of what we're doing right like we're trying to figure out how to move forward and the other thing that i love that i that i think he does and i'm so curious to talk to you about this that i think it's kind of genius is he almost like invites us to make snap judgments about people like he offers up these characters that you could be kind of and then he kind of you start to peel the onion and you guys get revealed and i would love to know how that works with you? Like, is it all on the page? Do you guys get to improv? What was the process like for you? It's funny. I, I, I live very near Ricky, and really, I saw him yesterday uh, with his long-term partner Jane. And I think the thing with Ricky, people were really surprised about Afterlife because it was, it was dealing with male grief, and I don't think many people have dealt with male grief. Um, and I think he was so brave because people associate him with this very acerbic kind of no fucks given out there and yet he still managed to keep that essence of Ricky with this brilliant observation of of men grieving and and he was very touched and I think quite overwhelmed by how how people men particularly reacted to that he he got so much traffic and 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 he was he was really bowled over and i think he found it very moving how he works as a writer and director ricky's very much an auteur so it's his project it's very much his vision he directed this um and he has his hands all over it and sometimes when you're an auteur and it's absolutely 100 percent your project you are able to give actors more leeway um, whereas sometimes you'll get a, a director who is interpreting the work of a writer who is so stuck on that script mm. that you can't let it go. But with Ricky, it was very much let's find the characters and he'd change things. You have to be open to improvisation. You have to be open to, he'll go, oh, that's funny, try that. And also with Ricky is he'll shoot and he'll shoot and he'll shoot and then it will all come together in the edit. So with the in series two with that with the group of the um, the actors that were in the Tambury players the Andrak, we shot four or five days worth of material. He could have had a series out of that, and I, I always think with Ricky that's kind of hard because he'll shoot everything and then he'll have to pick out the gems. Yeah. But uh, we you know he's he's now already started to write series three. So oh, oh yay, that's so yeah. exciting. He's incredible. <laughs> What's the story? I would like I know I don't want to dwell on it, but. So as, as an actress, like, do you, did you have a backstory for her, for your character? or, or did... So the weird thing, I mean, I've known Ricky for, for, for many years, you know, sort of going back on the kind of comedy acting, acting scene. And um, I just got this call. I was in the middle of doing a, what was I doing? I was doing a play and I was filming something else. I do a series here, a big series here called Friday Night Dinner. And I was in the middle of doing that. And then I just got this message to say, Ricky wants to know if you'd like to play this character. It's a new series he's doing. And I looked at it and it was like, it seemed it was hilarious, it was funny, it was on the page, um, it was one scene, and it was, I knew they never, he never sent me the script, so I didn't know the context. So I was also, so we, we had a rehearsal, we kind of worked around a bit, we, he rehearses with all his characters. And then I turned up on the first day, so I was the first scene of the first day of filming. And this never normally happens as an actor because you have to travel. But Ricky likes to film where we we live near Hampstead. So I walked to the set, which normally you're traveling like hours. <laughs> he walked to the set. We had lunch in our favorite restaurant. We then filmed this scene. 
I said, bye-bye, that was fun. Never gave it another thought. Didn't know anything about it, didn't know who it was, didn't have a backstory for her. Next thing I know, I'm invited to the screening of this thing and I, and I was sort of watching it. And I'm like, hey, this is completely, unbelievably brilliant. And I think ever since then, I've been a bit like, oh, that little scene that I never told anybody that I was in. I was into this massive, and then he's all come back, come back for the second. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that's brilliant. Well, I hope you're in the third series too. <laughs> I guess you'll let us know. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, well, so what's it like? We, we talked briefly when you and I chatted last week about, you know, growing up in London, um, a, a Jewish woman whose family weren't particularly fond of you becoming an actress. And we talked a little bit about your struggles. Like, how difficult was it for you to break into what you're doing? So I think my, my story is interesting to women who... <laughs> choose the path less traveled you know sometimes you've got to be very brave very strong or very stupid to go down the path less traveled and to, you know when I was growing up with Tracy in Stanmore northwest London we didn't meet actors you know acting was something that other people did that people who were children of actors did or if you lived in Hollywood it, it was like saying I want to be an astronaut so when I said when I used to say I want you know, I really want to be an actress my parents thought it was ridiculous I also think being Jewish, coming from an immigrant family, where you, you know, as Canada probably knows, Canadians women probably know, you know, you're an immigrant family, your grandparents come over with nothing, and the whole point is to try and create some security. So you educate your children and you try and get them to have better jobs than you had back in the East End. And so by the time Tracy and I were growing up, we were already that second, third generation who had been given an education and were expected to go into very safe and secure professions. So my family understood if I wanted to be a lawyer, but you're clever, you should be a lawyer or go into advertising or, you know, something like or accountancy, something secure. So they never encouraged me to do acting classes. They never encouraged me to, well, even to talk about it. It was like a joke. It was just a joke. You know, who became an actress in Stanmore in the sort of 70s? It was pointless. Uh, even to the point that when I went, I went, then went to, I promised them that I'd go to university and I started to do a classics degree, which they thought was pathetic as well, which I do not. But my parent, my dad always said to me, you know, quite frankly, love, if you are going to pursue this route, you are going to find yourself living in a single bedroom bedsit with a cat for the rest of your life. And every day that I'm not doing that, I feel that I'm winning at life. So, uh, you know, so it was a struggle and I had to be very brave. And so I, I finished my degree at university. I promised them that I'd do that. There was a writer called Arnold Wesker, who um, I always think that as women, we need somebody, a uh, sort of mentor, I think, sometimes when you take the path and struggle to this. The people that you meet along your journey that are so important. And I hope we feel that as women, that we can do that for other women. Uh, in this instance, it was a writer called Arnold Wesker. I did a play of his at Edinburgh Festival, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, you should do this professionally. And I said, my parents are going to kill me, no. He said, you want me to speak to them? And I said, no. And he went, well, between you and me, I'm, I really am going to encourage you to do this. I'm going to be on your, your back. So I got into drama school after university. My father was having a nervous breakdown, going, you've done four <laughs> years at university, now three years at drama school, you could have been a doctor at the end of all the studying. I left straight afterwards. He was like, well, if, you know, if I have to tell you, if you don't get a job instantaneously, do not come looking to me. You know, we, we can't help you out. You've got to be able to fund this thing. So somehow the gods, you know, like sometimes you've got to push at doors and sometimes doors just open. I left drama school. Within 24 hours, I've got an advert a voiceover for an advert who knew such a thing existed after eight it is the after him after all <laughs> uh, but, uh, got, got that that sort of gave me a wedge you know some money so that i could fund myself for a while then the second audition i went for it was for an advert for aerial liquid got that and then a few months later i got accepted at the royal shakespeare company and even then my parents my dad was going now this doesn't work out. You're not to come back to me. You've got to go and do it all. <laughs> so I think in my head, there was always the feeling of every day I've got to have, even if I'm earning 50 pence, um, I don't know what the equivalent is in Canadian money, but even if I'm earning 50 pence or a pound, then that is something that I have earned. So I've always had a real work ethic. So Tracy, what's your advice? Because, you know, like Tracy will relate to this. You know, I think she, she was saying she wanted to become a journalist and she did become a lawyer because she has similar parents. I was, I went to law school. I did, <laughs> I did it. You, <laughs> <great> <laughs> I 
So, and I, I think a lot of women out there will completely relate. So, like, what was it? Like, where did you find that courage when you were under incredible pressure not to do it? Like, what do you think it was? Like, if you were going to advise women, like, was it? A, did you listen to an intuitive voice? Like, any any advice that you would have? You know, I think it's. I think it's as simple as if it hurts you more not to do it than it does to do it, then you've got to do it. Does that make oh, sense? I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I also I think sometimes when you're working from an instinctive, you're it's finding your own truth. It's finding what your truth is, and if your truth tells you that you just couldn't live with yourself without doing it, then sometimes when you put yourself out there, the doors will just open. So rather than a bird throwing itself against a, a window trying to open it, sometimes if you kind of come to it from a place of truth just works out but I think it's about never losing the faith either it's knowing what your own bottom line is and you know Tracy yeah. will know you kind of uh, it comes to us at different stages and it was very brave you know I, I had a I had a long-term childhood boyfriend that I was with for seven eight years it was assumed I'd marry him and take the safe option and I, that was the first step of bravery uh, of thinking actually you know what I, I'm not ready for this and everybody thought I was crazy perfect you know this is security this is this is your childhood sweetheart and I you, sometimes you've got to take risks but the risks are easier to take because if you don't take them that's the harder route it's, if that makes sense no that, that is so true and I think you don't take them you, you will take them eventually I didn't do it when I was younger I did it in my you know late 30s 40s got divorced I, you know I was a lawyer I ran a business and now I'm, I'm doing this so but, so I, did, I, I was brave later on, and I think at some point we're all, I love your advice. I think it's amazing to everyone out there listening. I think it's just so great because you, you have to be brave sooner or later. I, I think with you, Tracy, you had already had such a big move, you know, yes. in, in your teenage years. You'd moved country, you'd moved everything you knew. So to take another big risk, I think, probably wasn't in your emotional it's, a toolbox at that time. It's true. I wasn't ready right there. Um, but anyway, I, I love your advice. It's brilliant. And I, I, we could talk to you for hours. Actually, I'd love to have you on again and ask more questions. But one thing I do want to talk about is we got COVID right now. And I guess it must be really affecting the theatrical community or the actors and all the TV shows and the theatre. And you have pivoted. And can you just tell us a little bit about what you've done right now? You've created this incredible series on YouTube. So just to, just to contextualise this, you know, I, 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 I always work. I've had a very good career. But this year, coming up was going to be a brilliant year. I had a four-part big period drama for the BBC, which was going internationally. It was amazing. It was set in the 60s in, in London. Then I was going on to a comedy for Sky with Stephen Graham and Danny Mays. And then a project I've been working on for such a long time, I was going to be playing the first female Shylock in The Merchant of Venice that was going on a wow. big national tour. It was going to be set in wow. uh, Cable Street. So it was a really big educational uh, big high profile version of the Merchant of Venice. This was the year that I had carved out, worked it out with my child, worked it out with my husband, all perfect. And within 24 hours, everything went down. So people in my profession are not furloughed. All the projects have been postponed indefinitely. Uh, and it's difficult because, you know, if you're a painter, you can paint. Um, I have been writing, but as an actor, you can't do it unless you're, you know, you're with other people. So, a writer who we knew called Julie Graham had a series that she was writing for quite a few of us uh, who we all know each other, sort of actors. Of a, I'm going to reclaim the word actresses in our 40s and 50s. And it was about a group of five women who'd all been kind of best friends for years, who'd been through births, deaths, marriages, and were now kind of going through the menopause, change of life, but change of everything. You know, you sort of get to 40s and 50s and your kids are grown up and who are you? What are you? What's your body doing? She had that in with big production companies, and in the end, they decided, you know what, let's do this as a, in lockdown. Let's see if we can spearhead how to film a series in lockdown. So she changed all the scripts, and she's done them as 10, 12-minute episodes. They shipped over to each of us all these lights. I mean, I've got more behind. I've got three different kinds of lights and microphones and all this equipment. And then a director... Her director, Robin Shepherd, told us all the shots that she wanted to get. And we had to utilize our own homes, our own families. In my instance, my daughter and her husband just couldn't be bothered. So I got the dog. I used to strap the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get a tracking shot of a martini cart. I put the 
the camera on the dog's collar. He's a really fat dog. And he just kind of mooched along. And this traffic drop, this martini is perfect. So oh, we have to learn how to film it ourselves, work out our angles, work out. And then we upload it all to her. She then sends it to an editor. And it's been turned, it's done really well. It's called Dumb Breeding. And it's about, it's about women kind of facing life together. But what I love about it is that normally women in their 40s and 50s are considered in the scrap heap end of him. Let's be honest. You know, oh, what is it? She, what is it? Uh, I always remember um, Sarah, um, Sarah, Tina Fey saying that, you know, once women were deemed unfuckable, they lost their voice. Is it Sarah and Silverman you're thinking of? Is it Sarah Silverman you were thinking of? No, Sarah Tina Fey. Oh, right. Tina Fey, sorry. But actually, let's be honest, most of us in our 40s and 50s, and particularly our 50s, this is, we're, we're rocking it at the moment. So totally this, rocking it. Totally. <laughs> well, this is it. This is yeah. our, we are having our moment because we're surviving COVID. It's yeah. the patriarchy. And in this particular instance with Dumb Breeding, we were the first people to really um, spearhead how it was possible to work in lockdown. So yeah. I was really proud to be part of that. And it's, it's brilliant. I've, I've watched some episodes. It's hysterical. It's really, really funny. I love yeah. it. I, lo I love your character. Yeah. <laughs> Great. It's so <laughs> funny, too, because I watch, I love the way Andrea Griffith put up that five minute to show actually how you were filming it, which I think is completely fascinating, as well as the series, because I, I love that. And also, full disclosure, I love design, so I love watching, but I like looking at all your houses. <laughs> <laughs> it's a local house MVP, people laughing, like, oh, I love that chair. Uh, so, but it is good. But I've got, you know, all our children are in it. My daughter's in episode six with me. Um, everyone else's children are in it and their boyfriends and their husbands. And their, so it's, and it's been interesting because we were saying, if lockdown comes to an end soon, you know, are we going to all meet and carry this thing on? And we thought, no, let's just, we'll just probably do nine or 10 really good episodes and then we'll, we'll see maybe for a second series. But we've all learned new skills. Angela is now directing the last this next episode. I'm going to ride with Julie on a couple of, on an episode. So it's been um, it's been women of an age that you normally would think absolutely leading the foreground. Yeah. Awesome. It's like you know it's fantastic, and I love the fact I, that's why I thought I thought look at women. Women we adapt, right? We yes and we you know, and it's it's just full proof of it. And also we're kind of fearless because because I think a lot of men sort of tend to look to other men and they, there's a lot of competitiveness. And I mean, this is a massive generalization. But on the whole, if women will pull together, we pull together. There's no ego in this thing. You know, everybody's... And also what I loved was that Julie said, I'm fed up with the menopause being a joke. Oh, oh. Treated as a joke. Like suffragettes used to be treated as a joke. Yeah. Remember the series, The Two Ronnies? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. We, we, we were the two Tracy. Remember? <laughs> My parents are British, so I lived and in the, the well. Yes, yeah, sort of feminism and suffragettes and were, were a punchline, a punchline ending, and similarly the menopause. And actually, what I love is that some of the most gorgeous, sexy, stunning friends of mine are actresses in their 40s and 50s who are getting cast now as grandmothers to men who are five or six years younger than them. And it's crazy. No, we, this is your prime. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to have to have another conversation with you. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. I, I have like so I many more questions. <laughs> no. Oh my God. I have so many questions, you know, so, um, thank you. So thank you for talking to us. We're going to list dumb breeding and anything else we'll okay, chat great. afterwards. We'll put it all in and let's talk again because this was, I just had like 50 more questions, but, um, one thing I would say yes. that I've, I've learned as a woman, at, at, you know, at 50 as, uh, is you teach other people how to treat you. And if you go in mm. lowering and diminishing your worth, if you go in making, you know, some sorry, I don't want to take up any space, never, you teach other people your worth and stand by that worth. That's brilliant. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank really, you for really that. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, stay on the line so we can chat afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, it was lovely to meet you. Lo lovely to chat with you. And uh, well, you'll be back. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to end this now. And, and if you guys want to see yeah. that second interview, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, you need to. And put any comments back because maybe Tracy can answer them when we do our second interview. Love to. Yeah, we always have to say that. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye.